quickly before we come on to the actual information security concepts i mean the, the risk management topics that are associated with the series certification i think it's very important for every one of us to understand the basic risk concepts and that's why you know we've got these few content that i thought are very very basic in nature you might you know feel that these are very basic in nature but this training is spanning across a mixed bag of a variety of uh, you know audiences we have uh, planned to design this course where in a way that uh, we start off from the basics and we graduate to a section where we talk about the course curriculum and then the rest right so information security as you all may be aware we've got the cia triad which is confidentiality integrity and availability right so to simply put confidentiality is the secrecy of data integrity is the trustful trustworthiness of the data or the you know truthfulness of the data and availability is the uh, making sure the right data is available to the right person at the right time so you've got all these controls processes framework all that that we talk about within the security realm is revolving around the cia triad right and all those processes governance is basically trying we're trying to achieve this at a very high level right so we anyhow we say something called as a strategy we have something called as a tactical goals a strategy goals and operation goals all of these you know processes framework that we'll be discussing in the course of time are trying to basically achieve these uh, cia goals for your organization right so confidentiality is again as i said is your secrecy of data right or preventing unauthorized disclosure so that's for confidentiality is you have a social engineering attack people you know have these people have random people call your critical employees for data they really like masquerade themselves as you know senior staff of the staff the board they try to you know, pick up some information over a phone right or through an email like a phishing attempt spamming all those are form of your social engineering basically trying to compromise your confidentiality of data right the training your separation of duties enforce policies and conduct and assessments these are your controls that you will put in place to avoid any social engineering attacks for your organization so training is basically your awareness program separation of duties is not every access or authorization is interested with a single person so that even if he is not secure uh, even if he is not aware of the nuances of how to operate it is still not a big risk because there is a second person who has to do that job in order to complete the transaction and then and hence it is still made secure so enforces policies conduct so that is set at the management level at the strategic level so these are things which will help you to avoid your social engineering attacks okay media reuse uh, and uh, strategies this is something around, again around you know data reuse we call it as you know where we have your sanitized media everything going forward uh, as due course of time you have your end of life or shelf life after which you will probably have to either reuse or you have to permanently destroy these medias in order to make sure that the data that was there once is completely scrapped off and it's not being reused by uh, either the next uh, user or it can be you know re engineered once it's in the hands of an unauthorized person so that that's again those are controls that you will have within your organization to ensure confidentiality of data for your physical devices and also for your logical drives as well eavesdropping is basically something like a middle man in the middle attack where somebody tries to understand what two parties are talking about we for common attack or a non technical example is a phone tapping right in, in earlier days we used to call them as phone tapping where we try to understand what the two parties are trying to discuss or communicate with each other even in modern war zones we have that you know attacks where enemy tries to hijack the frequency of the enemy radio communication right all those are typical examples of eavesdropping and then keeping sensitive information off the network so that's why sometimes you see all of our mfa and everything uh, you complete the transaction by virtue of having their password sent across in a different channel thereby even if the main channel is compromised it is still secure you can make use of the second factor in order to authenticate yourself so those are you know some of the examples and controls uh, encryption is obviously one of those uh, controls which you try to encrypt data with right it could be your symmetric encryption asymmetric encryption we'll talk about much of that in the slides to come right but in general at this point in time it's basically converting your plain text into cipher text using some kind of an algorithm so that it becomes unreadable for a unauthorized person so that's about your confidentiality so i'll take a quick a minute here or so i'll probably uh, since there is a couple of questions on i thought i would probably take these isaka registration exam for a processes at a later point in time uh, because we had these questions earlier today uh, i wanted to take a minute or so uh to address that and I'll probably continue with the rest of the slides so generally what happens with isaka is you can register there are two ways on how you can take up uh, isaka exams nowadays so either you can do a home based proctored exam or you can take up a proctored uh, you can go to isaka proctored exam center and then do a take up the exam from there so it depends upon where your geography is because of the covid situation today 
some of the cities might not be still open to such facilities, whereas some cities are open and some cities within India, and I don't know, I'm not very sure about how it is there in Dubai or UAE, but uh, at least in some cities in India, we still have that COVID situation running. And uh, you know, some of the cities do not encourage you to go to the center and take up the exam. So personally, when I took up the exam, I took it from uh, my home. So I'll probably uh, start off with by saying, you can register with ISARTA, you know, for free. You can have a email address and uh, you know, have a password to it by going to isaka.org. That's the website. Okay. So once you go there, that, that's pretty, you know, you, the moment you Google it in Isaka, uh, you'll be able to, the first thing that pops out is isaka.org. You can register yourself. And then once for becoming a member, you will need, need to pay a fee of probably 150 USD if I'm not wrong. Uh, and then you become a member uh, of Isaka. So once you become a member of Isaka, you can you, have, you get a lot of benefits. Like you get uh, the exam resources at a cheaper price. You get invites from your local chapter. For example, I am based out of Chennai in India, southern side of India. So there we have a Chennai chapter. So uh, I do get invites on the monthly PDM invites, which are now happening uh, virtually over a Zoom or a GoTo meeting invite. Those are the benefits you get: knowledge, books uh, for your exam resources for series, for CISA, CISM, series, and CG, IT. All those exams that Isaka contacts, you get those exam resources and uh, over the internet. You can either uh, order a physical copy or a you know a ebook, and all those. Are, uh, you will be given a discount for any of for all of those purchases if you are a member of Isaka, right? And when you register for the exam, again, you're given an option to either be a member of Isaka during the time of registration uh, or you can opt out and then say, I only want to register for the exam. No, I'm not interested in becoming an Isaka member. But trust me, being a Isaka member definitely helps uh, in terms of you know, socializing with other peers within your uh, uh, in the security world and other aspects. Yeah. So, in term, as I was saying, uh, the ISATA website uh, gives you an option to register for the exam and be a member at the same time, but you can opt out at any point in time if you feel that you would want to take up the membership sometime later. But the exam fee differs drastically, right? Uh, if you are a non-member, I think you have to pay somewhere around uh, a 750 USD as opposed to, a, uh, I think, a 560 USD for a member. So, that's the pricing point today, if I'm not wrong. Uh, it would be around $10, $20 either way. This is a very approximate figures. Um, so what happens is once you register, you again are getting two options depending upon your geography. If it, so I'll probably start off with the PSI, which is the home proctored vendor that Isaka has, uh, you know, have tie up with. The PSI is the vendor who, if you are here or working or trying to register, for example, from a location which is impacted by COVID still and it is still under lockdown, so you will only be given an option to take a home proctored exam, where you will. Uh, you know, register for the exam and you will get a link which will only open half an hour before the exam. You can pick your dates. You will be able to schedule the exam uh, at the time of registration, right? And then you can pick up whichever dates that are shown in the calendar. Then you can pick up those dates and time slots. And then there are some specific prerequisites for somebody who will need to, you know, sit for the home proctored exam. Like, for example, you will need at least a 4 GB laptop or a desktop. Uh, you will need at least a uh, vital KVPS of internet speed. You will need a webcam, if you're taking it from a desktop, if you're taking it from a laptop, your integrated webcam, if you, if you have one, is, is simply, uh, is all what is required, right? So those are three requisites from a, a home proctoring standpoint. And then uh, I'll, I'll move on with the process. What further happens is uh, once you are registered with the set date and time uh, timeline of your exam, ISACA link in your ISACA profile in the ISACA website, you should be able to start your exam like half an hour before the scheduled timeline. And you can go there. And what, once you go there, there's something called as a secure browser that gets downloaded to the machine. And uh, you'll have to basically pick your uh, place within the house, which is which has to be a little silent, just to have good internet reception. <clears throat> and uh, basically does not, not have a lot of items in that room. So make sure taking it from your house, yeah, it is basically a, a clean room kind of a setup uh, where, where you do not have more number of things around you. So you will have to basically do three things before you start the exam one is take a photo of yourself using the webcam the other one is show id proof of you know the name that you have registered for the exam along with the uh, the process that you have like for example a passport from india you can say an aadhar card or something which correlates to the exam registration details that you provided during the exam registration that has to be your second thing and then there's something the third one is your room scan so room scan is a very unique thing that uh, is only applied for home proctoring uh, candidates. So you'll have to basically use your webcam or the you know the integrated webcam of your laptop and show it around your uh, room to make sure that you are in a very secure uh, area. So by secure I mean there is there is no other person other than you and there is no other system or laptop besides you uh, in order for you to 
you know, uh, do an open book kind of an exam, right? So all that has to be recorded. You have to click on start recording. It's, it records the entire room's infrastructure. And then you can say submit. Once you submit it, uh, PSA online will nominate a person from their side and that person will contact you through a chat window. So he basically reviews all of these three artifacts that you've submitted and uh, he then comes back to you if he has any questions. So in my case, uh, what had happened was he wanted me to do a, a room scam specifically like under the table, right? Uh, uh, so he wanted me to give him an elevated aerial view of the room once more. So all those things will happen again, uh, which is like very, very self explanatory. Don't get uh, you know, scared or skeptical about how you will be doing these things all alone. It's very, very self explanatory. The UI is very, very simple. Uh, so you will be asked to re-record everything. Uh, you will have those specific uh, you know, options enabled on the screen. And it's, it's, it's a no brainer for anybody to go ahead and do that. And once you start doing it and once he's convinced that, you know, uh, you, your uh, room is secure, he then releases the exam. So once you release, uh, once he releases the exam, you are then given a window where you are given an option to, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, take a demo on the uh, controls that are given in the exam browser. So this exam browser, the secure browser that I was talking about, closes all other applications or windows that might be open in your system. It, uh, so that is a privilege that you have to allow and it taps your audio and video. So your webcam has to be on at all time during the exam and your uh, audio is also captured as part of the uh, prerequisites. Uh, and pl plus the secure browser disables all of the other applications uh, in the uh, in your computer that are, that are running. And it makes sure that only your exam engine is running at the, at the time of uh, the starting of the exam. So your time basically starts with 240 minutes, which is basically four hours. And uh, this demo will tell you uh, how you can navigate within the exam, uh, how do you move forward, how do you move backward, how can you flag a question. And, uh, you know, unlike uh, IAC square or uh, CISP exams, in Isaka you have an option of going back and uh, reviewing a question which was flagged, right? So, so those uh, facilities are still there. And trust me, CRISC is one of those exams uh, which is, you know, quite easy in terms of, uh, you know, uh, completing it. Uh, personally, I have not had any feedbacks from my peers or uh, my other exam takers who have said that they did run out of time. No, never. So questions, some of, some of the questions will be straightforward. So that will not take much of your time. There will be some questions which will be, you know, time consuming. So my, adv my kind of advice is you can probably mark them. If you think, you know, you are in a doubt, you can mark them, move on with the other simple questions, you know, kill them and come back. Right, that, that way you only have a limited number of questions to deal with and you will see how much is the number of time that you are left with. So that way, uh, in terms of exam and everything, uh, it is uh, quite easy. But the only thing is you'll have to be very, very uh, clear on how you approach those questions. And that is exactly why this training is for. So don't worry about it. I'll, I'll probably uh, give my best and help you achieve that. So that's in nutshell of what, how you do for a home proctoring exam. Uh, for the uh, Isaka proctored exam, usually, uh, uh, so when I took my system way back in 2015-16, it was all paper-based, uh, right? Uh, it was not even uh, online at that point in time. But once you are going to a uh, exam proctored exam, it's it's like quite easy. So you, you go there on the registered day, at least half an hour before your exam schedule time, on the venue, and then I think you'll have uh, designated people uh, who will help you to take up the exam, and they'll guide you on what needs to be done. So obviously there is there's not going to be a room scan or any other things like uh, on a home practice uh, case because it's already a registered site. But other aspects on you know submitting your originals, your uh, your passport, and other aspects will need to be done either way, right? So that's about uh, your home proctored exam, how you register for the exam, and uh, you know how do you become a member of Isaka. So yeah, let's move on with integrity. So as I said, uh, so we got integrity is the trustworthiness of the data, right? So it's how good the data was when it was sent. This is the same data that you're getting at the uh, receiving side or when it was thrown and when you're retrieving the data back, is it the same? Has it undergone any unauthorized or unexpected changes? All those are your integrity related uh, issues. So there is system integrity and data integrity. The quality of the system when it performs an integrated function in an unimpaired manner be from deliberate or inadvertent authorization. So that's the definition, right? So it is about qualifying the capability of a system to process data in the way that it should ideally do. So that is your system integrity. 
that a system is is not exposed to any kind of threats uh, in order to process our data so that is what system integrity is all about data integrity is about how accurate or consistent is the data in terms of you know the data by itself not considering the uh, human processing element we're not considering the system element we're only saying data in itself can it be immutable can the data be you know can can it hold its ground in its way that it is supposed to be right can it only undergo changes when an authorized person makes those changes right that is about data integrity the right? so system integrity talks about the equilibrium or the state in which the system has to behave in order to process data data integrity is basically something talking about the data in itself and the consistency of the data uh, that it has to undergo during the entire life cycle right so threats to data integrity could be corruption or malicious modification right so those things are threats that you will have uh, for which you need to have controls and processes in place to make sure that those are secured so that's in nutshell about integrity we'll talk in detail about other integrity related aspects and controls like caching and other stuff in the slides to come